How you feeling today? Amazing. Yeah? Well, w- when you walk in here, right, to church, there, there's, there's a certain pressure to say great, right? It doesn't matter what's going on in your life, how stressful it is at home or at work or how much conflict you experienced in the car right here or what kind of threats were made in the car, right? It doesn't matter how much trouble your marriage might be in or how, how overwhelmed you might feel as a parent. When you come in, someone says, how are you doing? How are you feeling? There's the response, the spiritual response, at least seems like we should say, okay, fine, good. And if you're really spiritual, then it's blessed, so blessed. <laughs> and we get in this competition about how blessed we are, right? Ever hear this one? How are you doing? Oh, I, I'm blessed. I'm so blessed. If I was blessed anymore, there'd be two of me. <laughs> or how about this one? If... If I was more blessed, I had, I'd have to sit on my hands to keep from clapping. That's pretty blessed, right? So we feel like the most spiritual answers aren't necessarily the honest answers sometimes. And they're not very vulnerable. But okay, fine, good, great, so great. How you doing? So great. And we kind of go back and forth with this. And that's kind of the answers we'd like to give. So in this series, we're going to be spending six weeks in this series, and we're going to be talking about uh, dealing with our feelings and our emotions in a way that is honest and in a way that honors God in our lives, in a way that leads us towards His purpose in our lives. And I know for some of you, the idea of a series where we talk about our feelings and emotions for six weeks, you're already tuning out, right? It's like, you you don't know how to feel about that, Right? Feelings, yeah. But you know how you feel about talking about your feelings for six weeks. <coughs> Sounds pretty miserable. I get it. Some of you men, this is where you're at today probably. You don't want to talk about feelings. You don't want to. You don't want to do this at all. But I would just tell you, those of you who don't want to do it are probably the ones who really need to do it. Let me tell you that. Like, your anger that you have, you don't know where the anger comes from But there's a connection between your anger and the refusal to talk about your feelings. You don't know where your apathy comes from. Like, you don't know where your indifference comes from. But that comes from some emotions and some feelings that haven't been surrendered over and redeemed by Jesus. And so we're going to talk about our emotions and our feelings. But it's going to be a little, it's kind of a little tough in this church because uh, this idea of feelings and faith, they don't always go together. That feeling, feelings do not fit in the faith equations. That's how we think about it. We read the Bible. We don't think about the feelings in the Bible. And maybe you grew up in a home or a church where when it came to your feelings, you were taught one of two things. There are right feelings and there are wrong feelings. There's the way you should feel and there's the way you shouldn't feel. And so when you felt this way, you were taught, don't do that. Don't feel that way. Feel this way. Like, that's just how you were discipled growing up. That's how you were taught to think as a Christian. Don't feel that way. Feel this way. Don't feel sad. Feel happy. I feel anxious. Well, don't do that. Don't be anxious. Be at peace. Like, that was the spiritual solution. And if this is how you're feeling, don't feel that way anymore. Well, what if I don't feel like not feeling that way anymore? Right? Right? How do you fix that? How, how do I fix that? So here's what's, ha- here's what's happened. Well, here's what happens. We start pretending, right? If you can't fix it, you just pretend. Fake it till you make it, right? Is that how? It, we start pretending we feel some way that we actually don't feel. And we'll say to people around us, when asked how we're doing, we'll say, okay, fine, good, but we're not okay, fine, or good. We just know that that's the right answer. We know that if we tell them how we're really feeling, they're just going to tell us to stop feeling that way. And that doesn't help. And so I'll say what's expected of me because I don't want to be told what not to feel. And so it's difficult, I think, for some of us to talk about emotions. And I've discovered for me, emojis have unlocked this emotional waterfall for me. <laughs> Things I never knew I liked. Like, I see the emoji, I'm like, that's how I feel. So I'm sending that one. It's so quick and easy. And so 
to use the emoji language, we might want to feel like this, right? But sometimes we really feel this way. Like, we know we want to feel this way, right? Kind of cool, calm, confident in life. But sometimes we, real, we, we feel pretty anxious and uncertain and overwhelmed. And we want to feel cheerful, but sometimes we feel like this. And sometimes we feel like this. Like, that's more real sometimes, right? And then sometimes we just find ourselves numb. Like the feelings are, not just, are just not there at all. And that's how we've dealt with our emotions. It's just kind of by shutting down. And so we, we don't necessarily feel happiness or sadness. We don't necessarily feel grief, but we don't necessarily feel, feel joy either. In our, in our relationships, we don't necessarily feel love and connection, but we don't feel the bitterness and the anger either that comes along with that. We just, we're just numb. We just allow ourselves to be numb. And so in this series, we want to talk about what it looks like to have emotional health as Christians. Because if we're going to be spiritually mature, we need to be emotionally healthy. And we're going to study the Psalms to help us with this. And so David, he's a great example of the man's man, right? David, he was a giant killer. Took out a giant with one stone and a slingshot. He was a mighty warrior. He became a powerful king. And he was a man after God's own heart. But he was an emotional dude. Just read Psalms. Like he had no trouble expressing his emotions to, and his feelings to God and to some of those people around him. And so we're going to use the Psalms to help us deal with how we feel, to help us manage our emotions. Now after saying that, this week though, we're not going to be in Psalms because I'm going to start the series off by taking a look at Jesus and how he handled his emotions first. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Matthew 26. That's what we'll be reading from today. And in Matthew 26, we're going to see Jesus in this very emotional time in his life. And I know if, for some of you, the idea of Jesus being emotional, it doesn't quite feel right. Because you don't think of emotions as being very spiritual. You don't think of of feelings as being part of faith. But if you read through the Gospels, one study shows that Jesus experienced 39 emotions throughout the Bible in his life. And some of you don't even know there's 39 emotions, right? Jesus, if you read through the Gospel, hit 39 emotions. There are all kinds of examples of this, right? So when he, when he meets a centurion who, demonstrates, who just gem demonstrated great faith, Jesus is delighted right? He's delighted. But Jesus is sad on the Mount of Olives when he looks over the city of Jerusalem and he thinks about the people who rejected him. And Jesus is angry when he thinks about the religious leaders who came, who care more about religious tradition than about life transformation. And Jesus is full of joy when 72 disciples come back and they're telling stories of the powerful works God has done in them and through them. And then Jesus weeps and he grieves with, when his friend Lazarus dies. And Jesus feels shame. You, know, you might not think this since he was perfect, but 1 Peter 2 says Jesus felt shame. Now, it wasn't his shame. It wasn't Jesus' shame. It was, it was our shame. It was your shame and my shame. But he felt shame. And so you read through the Gospels and you just find that Jesus has a lot of these different feelings to model for us. And so he at times was discouraged. But he also knew delight. He knew loneliness, but he knew love and longing. And Jesus knew pain, and he knew pleasure. And the, pain, the point in this is that his life here on earth, Jesus shows us emotions and, and feelings are not associated with being weak. Matter of fact, they're associated with being human. That this is who we were made to be, emotional creatures. And the question is not, are emotions or feelings right or wrong? The question is, what do we do with our emotions and our feelings? How do we manage them? How do we deal with how we feel? So in this series, we're going to be talking about that. We're going to, we're going to talk about this further. And I think it helps us understand where the word emotion comes from. So the word, word emotion comes from the Latin word emovere. I think I said that right. Which just means to move. So 
being moved by something, his emotions. God gives us emotions to move us. Now, the question becomes, if you're moving, where's your emotions taking you? And that's the key. Where's your anxiety taking you? If your emotions are a vehicle, you get in the vehicle of anxiety, and where are you going to go? That's, that's the real question. You get into the vehicle of guilt, where's your guilt going to take you? Where's your loneliness going to take you? Where's your anger going to take you? There are these emotions that aren't wrong initially in and of themselves. But the question is, what direction are you going to go with them? So think of it like this. Think of a road sign. You go left or you go right. You're going to go one direction or another. And every time you experience an emotion or feeling, you're getting in a vehicle and you're going to go this way or go the other way. So you're going to go, you're going to experience some shame. And when those feelings of shame come and you find yourself in that vehicle of shame, it's either going to take you to a place of isolation or it's going to take you to a place of forgiveness and freedom. If you're feeling loneliness, where's that vehicle going to take you? It's going to maybe take you to a place of depression and despair or it's going to take you to a place of connection and dependence on God. Now here's the point. There are all kinds of emotions that we might feel. Those emotions are an opportunity for us to move closer to God. Now, I want you to think about that and hear that again. Those emotions are an opportunity for us to move closer to God. The question is, what do you do with them? For many of us, when we felt these negative emotions, the big idea we've heard is, don't do that, don't feel that way. But biblically, we find what we find is that these emotions are the opportunity that God has to take us to a deeper place with him, to a more mature place in the spirit. And the question is, what direction are we going to go with him then? Which way? So in Matthew 26, Jesus is in the garden of Gethsemane. And there are just all kinds of emotions here in the scripture. It's already been an emotional evening for him. He's been in the upper room with the Last Supper. Judas left to betray him. Jesus knows what's going to happen to him. He knows he's going to be arrested. He's going to be beaten. He's going to be crucified. Jesus knows all this. And so when we pick up in Matthew 26, it's just, he's overcome and overwhelmed with emotions. Starting in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Geth Gethsemane. And he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, he took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, make the, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Now Luke another writer of, one, of the gospel, who was a medical doctor, the way he writes it, the way he tells us about this moment, he points out that Jesus experienced some physical symptoms of just feeling so emotionally overwhelmed. And Luke says in chapter 22, verse 44, and be, being in anguish, Jesus prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. This is a relatively rare medical condition known as hemothydrosis where capillaries, tiny little capillaries in the sweat glands, break because of overwhelming emotion or anxiety. And it creates this bloody sweat combination. Oftentimes followed by your body going into shock. But the point is that Jesus was emotionally overwhelmed in the moment. He says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. And I think there are some Christians who would try to counsel Jesus out of that. Right? Jesus says, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Don't feel that way. Feel this way. My soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. Smile. God loves you, Jesus. Did you know that? Haven't you read Romans 8, 28? In all things, God works together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Jesus, if you love him, if you're called according to his purpose, don't feel that way. Feel this way. You going to tell him that? 
Yeah, Jesus, you need to have more faith. No, I'm not saying that. I am not saying that at all. And yet, I think for many of us, that's the message. It's wrong to feel certain ways. You just need not to feel that way. You need to feel this way. And I hope for some of you, as you read about this emotional time in the life of Jesus, that it frees you from the pressures of Christianity that has been put on you to always feel happy. And if you come here and you are overwhelmed to the point of death, Jesus does not say, don't feel that way. Jesus says to you, I know how that feels. I know how that feels. I'm there with you in that. And understanding that, getting that theology right, completely changes how we process our emotions and our feelings. And so Jesus kind of models this for us. And I want to talk about two groups of people here, real quick. It's a little bit challenging to talk about emotions to this church because of something I love about this church. Maybe my favorite thing, one of my favorite things, is that this church is incredibly multi-generational, if you look around. I love that about this place. And so right now, you know, I'm speaking to at least four or five generations from top to bottom, maybe. Some of you might be part of the silent generation. So those who are a part of the, the boomer generation, for many of you, the boomer generation was taught emotional avoidance in their lives, right? And that this is, this is the way you deal with your emotions, is by avoiding them. They're negative. Stay away from them. And so certain emotions weren't allowed, and certain emotions should be avoided altogether. And then there are those of you who are like me, part of the next generation, who are raised by the boomers. Uh, we we kind of swung the, the other way. Uh, the Gen Xers, and then there's the millennials. And you know, it's not how we thought of things, avoiding. We, were, we weren't raised the same way. We were raised on Boys to Men, Whitney Houston, and Nirvana, right? So, like, you feel your feelings. You just put it all out there, it's, and, and it's different than how the boomers were taught. So, if it's emotional avoidance, if that's your approach, then it will catch up to you. When you avoid your emotions, it will catch up to you. If you stuff stuff down... You stuff it down, but then it surfaces in anger or it surfaces in apathy. And so you have to stop and ask yourself, why, why do I deal with what I deal with? Like, why do I drink when I drink? Why, you know, why do I compulsively look at porn? Why do I go on shopping sprees online and feel better? Why do I find myself with a spoon eating chocolate chip cookie dough, ice cream, directly out of the carton? Where, where is that coming from? Why do I go from relationship to relationship but can't seem to make a commitment? Why do I yell and scream and promise myself I won't then yell and scream some more? Emotional avoidance oftentimes is the reason. Because you just stuff stuff down and you stuff it down and it comes back up. But the Bible talks about what's in the heart comes out. It comes out eventually. Now, how many times you stuff it back down? The millennials and Gen Xers. Now, this, this tends to be the, kind of the other extreme. So we'll talk about them. It tends to be more emotional indulgence, right? It tends to be emotional indulgence. We just, we just feel our feelings so freely, right? That's our approach. That's how many of us were discipled culturally. Just feel your feelings, whatever you feel, and that's what's right. Just... Find your identity in your desires. Let yourself be dominated by your feelings. And so your feelings are your GPS in life. Like you wake up and however you feel, that's how you determine your day is going to go and how you're going to treat people. And you just feel your feelings. A little simpler than stuffing it down, but still just as bad. And if there were people around you, well, sorry, sorry. That's just how I feel today. What am I supposed to do? I mean, that's just, that's just how I feel about the situation. And your feelings have become your thermostat in your home or in your workplace or in your school. And it determines the temperature for people around you. Think of that. It's your thermostat. So how you react to your feelings, that's how people are going to see you and feel. There's a doctor named Dr. Daniel Coleman who did a study. He talks about just the power and dynamics of this. He says emotions are more contagious than the flu. He says that this dynamic is so powerful that 
in one study, three volunteers sat silently in a circle for two minutes. And at the end of the time, the most emotionally expressive person transmitted his or her mood to the other two without saying a word. In every such session, the mood the most expressive person, the mood the most expressive person had going in was also the mood the other two felt going out. Whether happy, bored, anxious, angry, and some of you are sharing life with someone like this. Just emotionally indulgent, just feeling their feelings. And yet, as we study scripture, what we're going to see is that our emotions are a gauge. Our emotions are a gauge, not a thermostat. They are, that they are meant to, to get our attention. They are meant to move us in a direction that makes us more like Jesus. We were, where we're able to accomplish God's purpose for our life where we're able to become more spiritually mature as we become emotionally healthy. But you've got to pay attention to the gauge, right? It's like when you were young, when you're driving maybe your first car, and you see the check engine light come on, right? You know you need to do something because the check engine light came on. But, I mean, you can look under the hood, but you don't really know much about cars. So there's no really good reason to look under the hood because you wouldn't be able to know what you're looking at. And, and so maybe you could take it to a mechan the mechanic to find out what's the problem, but you don't have any money to pay for what he finds out it is, so you decide just to ignore it, right? We've never done that, right? Never ignored check engine lights. And then you start having friends in the car with you, and they're saying, hey, your check engine light's on. You should get that checked out. Yeah, yeah. And finally you get so tired of explaining the whole situation that you take black electrical tape and just put it over the light, right? <laughs> then you don't have to look at it. You don't have people seeing the light anymore. You just don't have to worry about it. I mean, you've probably seen this, right? <laughs> yeah, it's out there. And then one day, say on a hot summer day, one of the hottest days of the year, and you're just getting out of the grocery store and you got some of the ice cream I talked about earlier, and, and uh, you go to start your car, start, car starts up, you put it in drive, and it goes nowhere, Right? Because, come to find out, the makers of the car actually uh, they made, designed it so that when the transmission was having issues, the light would come on so you could get the transmissions checked out. And so, instead of a small repair bill at the very beginning when the light first came on, well, now it's a very big repair bill to get the car going again. And so, for many of us, this is what our emotions are trying to do. It's trying to tell us, hey, I need to get your attention. We need to take a look at this. And we try for a while just to look away from our emotions. We try to avoid it. We try to cover it up with some black electrical tape. Other people might point it out to us, say, hey, you got to take, take a look under the hood. Something's going on. But we just keep driving, just doing life. And then eventually the whole thing blows up in your face. And so the question is, how do we deal with our feelings and how do we deal with our emotions? That's really it. And in Matthew 26, Jesus models this for us. He gives us an example of what it looks like to release our feelings to God so that those feelings can be redeemed so that he can do for our feelings what he does for all of us. Makes them new. So for the, first, the first thing you need to see that Jesus does is this. He tells his friends how he's feeling. And he asks his friends to stay with him. Verse 38, then he said to them, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here with me keep, and keep watch with me. Look, don't miss this part. Jesus is vulnerable with some of his closest friends. And it wasn't weak for him to do that. It was strong, actually. And he doesn't do it with all his disciples, just the three of them, his closest like the point of the series is not like when someone stops you in the lobby at, the ch at church and says, how are you feeling, how are you doing, and you don't really know them. The point of the series is not to just throw up all your feelings all, all over them. That's, that's, we, don't, we don't really want to do that, right? But there does need to be two or three people in your life that you can be honest with about your feelings, that you, need to go to, that you can go to them. And when they ask you, you tell them the truth of how you're feeling. It's not weak for you to do that. That's like Jesus for you. That's like Jesus for you, you to do that. Being like Jesus. That's what he did. And it takes strength 
to open yourself up to your friends. It takes courage and it takes humility, which is a hard thing for some people. And so Jesus says to Peter, James, and John, I am overwhelmed. And he says, stay here with me. Stay here with me. There's many of us who have this tendency when we are in that vehicle that's having issues. We just want to be alone. We just want to deal with it ourselves. We don't want people talking to us. We don't want anybody with us. But Jesus says to his friends, I need you here with me. The second thing he does is he prioritizes his faith over his feelings. He might say that, we might say that a little bit different. If I could put it this way, he aligns his feelings with what God wants for his life. He aligns his fe- what, how he feels with what he knows is true. Now, that's not easy, what I just said. That is not easy at all. And we read in verse 39, it says, Going a little further, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so Jesus, he falls on his face, and he's honest with God about his feelings. And yet he concludes by saying, God, it's not what I want. It's how I feel. It's not how I feel that matters. It's what, it's what you want. I feel this way, but you want this. Now, for those of you who are more in the emotionally indulgent category, this is really significant because what we've been taught, you just feel your feelings, and if you, that's how you feel, that's, that's what's right. And if that's how you feel, that's, that's what you should do. If that's how you feel, that's who you should be. But see, Jesus doesn't do that. That's not the example he's setting for us. Instead, he is honest about his feelings. He doesn't pretend to feel something other than how he feels. What, but he processes it with God and he concludes, God, whatever you want is what I want. You may feel like losing your temper and punching a hole in the wall. You may feel like staying in bed all day and feeling sorry for yourself. You may feel like avoiding social situations that cre- create anxiety. You may feel lonely in your marriage and want to move ahead with the affair. You may feel like getting a divorce and just starting over. You may feel like running up the credit card debt. You may feel that way. That's okay. But where's that feeling going to take you? I'm not going to stand up here and say, well, don't, just don't feel that way. What I'm going to ask you is, where's that feeling going to take you? And so some of you need to understand that what you feel is real. But just because it's real doesn't mean it's true. This is a hard concept. What you feel is real, but just because it's real doesn't mean it's true. What I mean by this is, you might say, I I feel lonely, okay? Like, that's like the worst way to feel. I I hate being lonely. But that's, that's a real feeling. You feel it. I know, I know that's how you feel. But you know what? It's not true. If you're a follower of Jesus, it's not true. You may feel lonely, and it's a real feeling, but... He's with you. He never leaves you, and he will not forsake you. You have not been left as an orphan. You've been filled with the Holy Spirit. Spirit, there are people who love you and care about you who are brothers and sisters in Christ all around you. Now, I know that's how you feel. I know that's not how you feel. And I know you feel what you feel is real. But what I'm saying is, you may feel what you may feel may be real, but it isn't true and you're not alone and you may feel shame and guilt and that might be real the shame and guilt in your life but it isn't true if you're a follower of Jesus the truth is there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus and the truth is you've been set free from the law of sin and shame and that's what's true may be real but it's not true And so follow the example of Jesus and you're honest with God about your emotions. But then you align your feelings with what God wants for you in your life. And so here's what we see with Jesus. He comes into the garden and he's overwhelmed with anxiety and emotion. But he spends an hour to three hours in the garden praying on his face before God and then the soldiers come. And where is Jesus? He is resolute. Something has changed. He is, he is not... 
on his face. He is standing up strong. He is determined. He has set his face towards Calvary. Just a second ago, he was on his face crying to God, sharing his feelings. Now he's standing strong in the faith of what's happening. The third thing that Jesus does is he just is honest with God. He pours out his feelings to his heavenly Father. Verse 39 says, Going a little further, he fell on his face to the ground and prayed, My Father. And Mark uses the word Abba for Father. I love that word. We've, we've, it's, it's just more intimate, more personal term. It's more like saying Dad or Daddy. And Jesus modeled for us a way to pray. That we, we process our feelings and our emotions with God in prayer. Now for some of you, that, that's really difficult because it's not how you were taught to pray. Some were taught to pray by reciting words, right? We all have our bedtime prayers, right? We get the kids to do. And you didn't know what they meant, and you're not really sure what they mean now, but you still know them. You still know these prayers that you were taught. And you can still recite them, but you weren't taught to pray this way. But that's what Jesus does. He just cries out and he says, Father, my soul is overwhelmed to the point of death. What would that look for, like for you? You say, Father, I am so, I'm so stressed out right now. I'm so sad right now. And I don't know why, Father. And I'm just so disappointed in my marriage. I'm so angry with my child. I'm so bitter towards my parents. I'm so anxious about my future. I'm so lonely. I just want to die. When was the last time you talked to God this way? And see, God wants to redeem those emotions. But he can only redeem what you release to him. So that is the challenge of this series. The challenge of this series is to understand our emotions. That they are a vehicle that's going to take you somewhere. And it's time for you to pull over to the side of the road and open up the door and invite Jesus in. He doesn't want to sit in the passenger seat, by the way. He wants to sit in the driver's seat. And that's, that's part of the deal. So you get out, you walk around, and you sit in the passenger seat. And you give him the will. And then you open up the back door and invite a couple friends on in too. That's the way Jesus has set this up. He is with us, and then we're with one another. And you say to Jesus, where are we going, Jesus? I feel, I feel angry today. Where are we going? And you invite God to meet you in your emotion. You invite God to meet you in that feeling. You might not think he wants to be in that feeling. You might not think he wants in when you feel that way. There's a lot of times you want to feel like you just push him out. No, you don't want to be here with me. But I feel like this. But he does. God's say, God, I feel scared. Would you drive today? You invite him into your fear. You invite him in when you feel overcome with lust. God, this is how I feel. Would you redeem this feeling? Would you sanctify this? You invite him in when you're sad and you don't know why and you don't feel like being here around other people and you don't, you're not really sure what to say. And you just say, God, would you, would you get in the car with me? He'll join you there. Your feelings, your emotions are an opportunity to invite God in and to move you to a different place. All of us have feelings. All of us have emotions. That's the way we were made. And we were made in God's image. So he knows. It's not about being weak. It's about being human. The question is, where are they taking you? And who's in the car with you? So in this series, what we want to do together is to invite Jesus to the driver's seat of our lives, our emotions. Invite a couple of people to join in on the journey with us. And to be a church that is not just okay, fine, good. Or pretty good here in Minnesota. Where we don't just come in here and put on a plastic smile and say, everything's great. I'm doing great today. When everything is not great. But we understand that this place is where we're together and we can invite God in and we can ask him to move us to where he wants to move us to. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we just, we come to you with our feelings and our emotions and it's scary. I know, Lord, it's scary to, to open up and be that vulnerable to somebody else, especially to the maker. But who else can take that from us and use it for your will except for you? We want to be a church that allows you in the driver's seat so that we, we don't have to worry about how we're feeling because we have you on our side. We have our friends, our Christian friends are here to help us through it, no matter what's going on in our lives. We just pray that you lift us up, Lord, every single one of us, and just give us the courage to open up. And in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Have a great week, everybody.